Okay, so here is where I decided to call the project done. And you can see we added a few more decals, moved some things around. Uh, there's a few extra little flares on the material that I'll show you here in a second, and I'm not talking about that lens flare. We'll talk about that too. Um, so we'll just start at the bottom. So we've got our base metal, which didn't really change. I think I went in and knocked some of the dirt back on these, these scratched out areas, but that's just here in this little paint layer. And then the orange enamel, white enamel, and powder coat black. In the emissive, I have uh, basically done what I described I would I was going to do. And uh, I've got all these fills here that are basically instancing this, uh, this base paint here. The yellow mask creates a referenceable uh, anchor point with the paint and then each fill just brings in that yellow mask and then I can just move it around to other spots in the UVs uh, by going over to the 2D view and just kind of scooting it around. Um, so that was covered in some detail. I'm not going to go into to too much about it now. I just want to show you that I went ahead and, and did all that stuff there. Uh, let me head back over to 3D. I've got some extra stuff here that I usually add. It's, it's uh, no more complicated than anything else uh, that, that I did, which is uh, I've got some dirt. I can't remember if uh, I included the dirt or not. And my general philosophy with this kind of stuff is you don't notice it and then when it's turned off you say oh yeah that was making a positive contribution right we don't want it to be like giant clumps of mud unless it's a uh, you know an off-road vehicle or something and that makes sense uh, we've got oil which again you know it's just one of the things about oil is it's gonna it's gonna be real shiny so you can see as we get in there it gets a real nice kind of greasy hit but otherwise it kind of just blends in with the dirt and uh, I guess I can show you what the settings for that are. Let me go to my uh, properties. So with the with the dirt, we're gonna have it's gonna be very rough. So there's not any gloss or very little gloss. It's gonna be not metal at all. Very dark. Usually I'll have a little bit of warmth in there. You can see it's got just a, a touch of red. You could do brown or yellow or anything that kind of stuff. And then we don't even need normal height or emissive here. Now with emissive, where, where I have the emissive kind of blocked off here, let me turn off that flare for just a second. All right, it is in display settings and then down here in activate post effects glare. So I'm just gonna turn that off. So what I was gonna say is if you have dirt or anything that you want to obscure something that is emissive, then you need to make sure that you include emissive and set it to black and that way you can You'll, you'll basically be able to block out the emissive, otherwise the emissive will punch right on through if it doesn't have its own black emissive value. So we talked about the dirt, we talked about the oil. With the oil, this is kind of the inverse of that. It's very, very shiny, low roughness value, and it doesn't need any height uh, or normal or emissive. This is just that stuff right in there in the crevices. Color is black, metalness, want the metalness turned off. And uh, so it's fairly, fairly simple. And then in terms of the masking, it's whatever, you know, just one of these smart masks with some paint, a paint layer on top to kind of dial it in. And then because I wanted to have some orange stuff on top of the powder coat, I just made a new layer and made it orange. And then I was able to go in and do that. I think I gave it a little bit of height, very, very low value of height, but you can see it gives it a nice little emboss there, which I think is kind of cool. And the reason I had to do it this way is because the orange is beneath the powder coat black. So rather than trying to like have the whatever I'm painting into the orange cheek cowl also knock out the powder coat black, it's easier to just go ahead and make a, a new orange one on top of that. And then for the barrels here, there's the exterior. I kind of wanted to make it feel like it was... Also, I added black to the front here. So we get a little bit of some shadowing there because I, I also put the orange decal on the front and I kind of want to just tone it down a bit. And then my interior, we can see what that does. And the interior is basically just black, no metal, 100% uh, rough. So there's no highlight at all. And then there's a little recess to it, a little lower height value, which I don't know, maybe you can't even see because it's 
really ideally not going to be catching any light in there at all. You can kind of catch, I guess, a little bit, some somewhat. But anyway, and then emissive, we don't need it, probably need that. So, and then rust. Rust is always a wonderful thing, but uh, less is more, right? Like just a tiny bit, just a little hit here and there. And again, it's like you don't even notice that there's any rust on there until it gets removed. And then you say, oh yeah, I can kind of see how that's making a little bit of a contribution to the overall feel without getting too aggressive with it. I mean, some things are going to be rusty and then you've just got to punch up the rust. But uh, if it's just a, a little garnish, visual garnish, then you don't want to go crazy with it. So now that we've got that done, there's one more thing I want to show you on the Maya end. I am very confident that they would not let me into the Game Artists Club if I shipped out something that had this much wasted space in the UVs. So I have addressed that issue and I kind of want to show you what I did. So the, the problem is that this is a, an optimized shells approach, if, uh, if that makes sense, where the sh there are the, as few shells as there can reasonably be, but the problem is they just don't pack very well. So what I did is I went through and like broke it there. And I think I broke it there. So like once you break it, then it only has to deal with this much shape and it can find other places to, to sort of stash it. I think this I probably broke at least in half. Uh, I can't, oh, and then these I chopped these little pieces off here because this right there, like, it just makes it hard to find something to do with all the space. So we end up kind of losing it, right? But if you just chop it, then you get a lot more flexibility with where it can go and live. So with those changes, that is what it looked like. And this is kind of the important the important value here. So if I go to my, in my uh, UV toolkit, down to my textile density, which is inside the transform uh, menu, and you just, with your UVs selected, your geometry you know can be selected, you hit, um, oh also, and I've entered 2048 into my map size, we can hit get, and you can see my, my textile density here is 333 texels. So what that means is, if this is one meter of world space, then I'm going to have 333 texels to uh, play with, right? And I don't, I, I have no idea what what the how big this thing actually is. This is just kind of a, re a relative value, right? So if I go to the updated UV layout and I hit this button again, it goes to 368 texels per unit. What that means is I'm getting 10% more texels per unit with this updated UV layout. So that is definitely worth doing. There's way less wasted space and I'm not going to get any wrinkled noses from people that might be watching this who have some, uh, some experience with doing UVs under their belt. So once that is done, I think I probably demonstrated this, but the process for updating the geometry is you just go to edit, project configuration, select, go find your updated mesh, whatever it happens to be. And then you are, because your UVs are different, you're gonna have to go to your texture set settings and essentially just bake everything. Um, well, you just rebake all your mesh maps. Keeping in mind, in this case, we've got that little backflip that we need to do with the material ID. So now that we've got that, I wanna very, very quickly show you how to make a render with this. What you do is you go to mode. And I mean, you can just do a screenshot of this and I think that's probably, that's gonna be fine for a lot of uh, applications, but if you want it to really sing, you go mode rendering, and we will basically switch to a different tool set available here in um, Substance Painter. And at, in this case, I'm gonna hop back over to my display settings. If I can find them. Oh, I'm, I'm, already, I'm already there. So I'm gonna turn on my activate post effects and this will give us a little bit of glare. Obviously you can see that, uh, that awesome disco hit there. So what it's doing is it's basically resolving the render and when you move the camera, it just, it has to kind of flip out for a minute before it can, it can get its bearings. So maybe you can hear my fan on my computer going right now. It's cause it's, it's rendering this. And if I go to this little thing here, oh, it's just off, sorry. Let me scoot this over. So I have this uh, little magnifying glass, which is my render settings. You can also probably just go over here, views, and then render settings. But you can see I've got this word here, it's yellow, it says rendering, that's, uh, that is the computer working. And the settings here 
are a little bit higher than they would normally be. So it's going to uh, you can increase the, the samples and the max time, and you may or may not see an improvement in the visual quality here um, after a period of time. You can kind of you know uh, play with it as you'd like, and you can do things like have a clear color for the background. You can change what environment you want to use to, to do your lighting with. You don't have a huge amount of control over this. I mean, there's a lot of options, but you can't like put a light somewhere. So one, you can see there's like some little white crap right in here that's not really resolving. The longer you let it sit, hypothetically, the more that's going to go away. But um, a trick that I like to use, let me go ahead and just hide my display settings. And I'm going a little bit over here, but this is the last video, so I think we can all just handle it, is I'm going to let it cook for a second. I should not have just bumped the camera. I'll pause it for a minute. All right, so I'm going to get a shot with the light coming from this direction. And what I want is there to be a little bit more light over here. So there's a simple Photoshop trick we can do. I'm just going to rotate the light by holding shift and left mouse button and giving it a nudge here. Sorry, little white lie. It is shift right mouse button. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just rotate the light so it's pointing on the surfaces that I want. And here we get a nice little extra hit on that. So you can just include this as well, but I'm just gonna hit print screen. I've already got the other image over there in Photoshop. So having hit print screen, I'm going to hop over there. Here we are in Photoshop. So I've got the first render with the light coming uh, on the main surface here. I've got my second render with the light coming from the other surface. And what I can do is in my blending, I can go to lighter color and you can see here, I'm essentially grabbing the lighting from the other side because it happens those pixels are lighter. And then you can dial this in with a little opacity, you know, whatever. There's, there's lots of things that you can sort of do from here. But anyway, that's a, an easy way to composite your renders with different lighting scenarios in uh, Substance Painter. And there you go. Um, hopefully this has been a useful experience for you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email and I'll try to get you sorted. Thank you very much.